All right, welcome back, everybody. We uh, have our next guest with us, and I'm really super thrilled to talk to this person. They are not uh, into researching Bigfoot, uh, don't really know anything about the subject, but had a very interesting encounter. And one of the people that listens to my show uh, knows this person and uh, put me in touch with them. And they were very kind enough to come onto the show and actually tell us about this encounter. And uh, this is one of those ones that occasionally they come along and you go, what? But it's actually uh, in keeping with some other things that have happened nearby there. And there are reports of this sort of same weird thing going on back at least 500 years ago. There was a night in the area that they had a fight with one and had a, a nice picture of it commissioned, had an artist do it, stood right there, made sure he got it accurate and then had a woodblock print of it made and had multiple copies and handed them out to his buddies. Hey, I killed an ogre 1,500 years ago and not too far from where this encounter happened. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to bring on uh, Daniel. Thanks for coming on the show, Daniel. Yeah, you're welcome. No problem. Really appreciate it, man. Yeah, um, had you ever heard anything about Bigfoot in your background before this happened? Had you ever, like seen a movie about it or had friends tell you they'd seen it or anything like that? Well, I, you know, I'll see, and you know, when you're a kid, you kind of see things here and there and they talk about Bigfoot, but nobody really believes anything that's out there um, right. until you, you actually see something and, and when you see it, you really don't believe it yourself, honestly. <laughs> so, you know, there's a proof that you actually saw something because that's what all of us who have seen something actually feel like. And sometimes we're dumb enough to go back for two or three more looks to just convince ourselves that it's really there. Never mind the fact that we're really risking our lives and being stupid to do it and should have had enough sense to go, okay, yeah, I saw that. I wasn't hallucinating. Uh, yeah, they're out there. I'm, I'm going to leave it well enough alone. So hopefully you won't go looking for them after this point. But it, it sounds like, uh, you know, this is an interesting interesting enough situation to to find yourself in. It was in, a, in the sort of a, a locale and a job description where you would never, ever expect something like this would happen. Um, so do you want to set the scene and kind of walk everybody into uh, what, it, what it looked like, what the day was, was, uh, was going like, and uh, what you were actually doing, what your job was at the time that this was happening? Yeah, sure, no problem. Well, shoot, I, I was a youngster back then. I was uh, 18 years old. I'm 45 years old right now, um, and like you said, my, my buddy was just put, posting something about Bigfoot, and I was like, you know, I have an encounter like that that no one's ever heard about. Honestly, I've only told probably three people in my entire life. So here I am in Germany, 18 years old, and we're on a, a military base doing a tank training, tank training, and as we go doing all these tank trainings. It's nice and early in the morning. And um, we're doing different maneuvers here and there. And we're just taking them across, uh, heading out across, uh, you know, army base, basically what it is. And we they kind of rent this area, I guess, is what it is. And um, from the Germans, obviously. <laughs> and, well, the Germans probably use it for the same thing when you guys aren't using it. Right, exactly. Yeah, we did see some German tanks here and there on that same base. They they do the same training. Some of the Leo tanks there and everything were there when we were there. But were you guys um, using Abrams or what were they letting you run around and t and train in? Yep, M1A1 Abrams. Nice. Yep. Very nice. So, so here we are. We have like a V formation, four tanks, and we're heading out. And I mean, it's probably I don't know. It it was it was completely light. So I'm saying maybe eight, nine o'clock in the morning and we're doing these trains and I'm look I look over to my right and I could see something. Now wait I'm before like, you go too far, Daniel, what does the terrain look like? Are you in the woods? Are you out in the open? Is it a mixture? Is there scrub bushes? What are we looking at here? we're just driving. It's kind of, we're kinda of going on up on like in between like a saddle basically and it had a hill. I can't remember to the left of me too much but to the right of me it was a just a grassy hill and then on the top of the the hill was a bunch of uh big giant trees just a forest forest area mm -hmm. so as we're heading over we're just driving you know and i and on that grass and it's not very tall i mean it might be 
maybe six inches tall or so. All right, so it's not obscuring your view. No, no, not at all. It's, I mean, it's, it's. You can see everything. It, it was a beautiful morning, you know. And so we're we're heading across, and I look over to my right, and I could see something. And I go, man, that looks like a, a horse, like the backside of a horse. I mean, it's it's ginormous, you know. I'm like, okay. I, so that I would be confusing because okay. how would a horse get out on a, a you know, a armored training base? There's big fences around those places, aren't there? Yeah, exactly. That's why I couldn't even imagine. I'm looking at that, thinking, "Wow, what, what's a horse doing out here?" But then I didn't pay much attention to it. And I kept on driving. We weren't going very fast. They only top out at 30 or 35, somewhere in that range, and we weren't going near that speed. So I look back up. You know, it's in a distance at this time. I look back over there again, and I'm closer, and I could see that. It's not a horse because I don't see no tail. And then the angle of it, I'm like, that is no horse because the top side looks like it's, I don't know, let me see, the same size as a horse. So I'm saying maybe like at least the, I thought it was like the neck and everything. I, the front looked like it was like seven foot tall and the rear looked like it was probably five foot tall. And I'm like, what the heck? And so we're getting closer and closer, and at this point, I'm probably not even, man, I would say 100, 150 yards away from it. So you see it pretty good at this point. Is this thing even, like, moving? I mean, a lot of times when somebody spooks a Bigfoot, they take off like a lightning bolt. This, this thing had no cares in the world. It was walking, just regular pace. And and I was just amazed. I'm just thinking, man, that thing is ginormous. And so, and then as we're getting closer and closer, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, hmm, you know, because we're farther away. We kind of do a little, I don't know if we turn just a hair or something, but I'm still looking out to my right and I could see it and I could see it walking. But the front of it, wasn't walking like a horse. All the front side of it was just like lifting up and down, like straight up and down the front two legs and the back ones were just kind of shuffling forward. But these legs looked like they were eight inches round from top to bottom. There was no 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 hoof. There's no I couldn't really see the very bottom bottom of it, you know, because we were in grass still. But I couldn't see no kind of foot or nothing, I could just see a massive, I mean, I guess they were arms and legs is what they look like to me. I mean, there's there's no mistaking it. it. That's what it was. But just the shape alone, I said that that's not a horse. And, of course, you don't say anything. You're, I mean, you're in a tank driving it. What are you going to tell your tank commander? Right. Hey, look over there, you know. No, you you just keep on driving, so. So, so you were driving, which is how you managed to get a good look at it to start with, because you're you got to pay attention. You're driving. Um, was the thing the thing was moving more or less the same direction you guys were going? No, it, it was going towards the, that wooded area on top of the hill, and we were okay. going across like into the saddle. Right. So, so you're going, you're just, going up the saddle, and he's sort of veering off at a forty-five away from you up the slope toward the woods. Yes, perfect. Yep, that's exactly how it was. Okay, got it. And then I could see that the hair on this thing, I mean, honestly, it didn't look like, I mean, I've seen all these pictures and, and they, you know, they're saying it looks like a monkey and this and that or whatever, but I could actually see, I mean, it was not as thin as like a horse, but not, you know, six inches long fur either. It was kind of just and it wasn't matted. It wasn't nothing. It actually looked like well groomed to me. <laughs> and, and and the crazy thing is the color, because that's another thing. The color looked like it's not all dark and black. Like they they I mean they show all kinds of different stuff. It was almost like a beige. It's almost like a summer a deer color, but like in the summertime before they turn gray is basically how the color was on this thing. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell the folks here that uh, after we contacted each other and talked about this a little bit, I sent you a few illustrations that I had on file of uh, artist renditions of 
Bigfoot moving around on all four legs. And the one that really stuck in my mind when I was listening to your descriptions, the first one I sent to you, and what did you say when you saw that one? That picture was almost identical to what I seen. The shape, the 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 posture, the front arms, the front legs. I mean, it looked identical. I mean, they're, everything's round, like from top to bottom, arms and legs. You could even see, like, their hands, like, folded over, you mm-hmm. know, but you can't – I mean, it – it looked like it was just a like solid like tree trunks basically, and right. that picture when I seen it, I mean I honestly I couldn't believe it. There's only two pictures I've ever seen that look like what I seen, and that was one of them. Well, I'm glad that I have such an extensive file of all these pictures handy to send to people when they get, they call me and they have an encounter or something, so they have something to look at and reference, um, and just for those specificity of it, I will have this um, picture of this up, of course, at this part of the show, so everybody can be looking at it. And you commented that the only thing really wrong with it, from what you could see, was that the uh, illustration has hair that's a little bit too long. Yes. Yes, that's the only thing I could see different. And, of course, this thing never turned around. It just Mm -hmm. kept on walking at that steady pace straight towards the woods. It never turned around, so I can't say, oh, yeah, I seen a face, or I seen this right. or that, or it had fangs, teeth, um, none of that. But I could just see the outline of, it almost looked like just a head that was connected to shoulders. I mean, it was basically, <laughs> that there, yeah. there was no neck, let's say. Right. Let's say that. Yeah. There's one part of the South where the local nickname for him is the no necks. <laughs> that was before yeah, they even knew right. what Bigfoot was or had ever heard of the word Bigfoot. They were all calling these local weird monster things called the Nonex. So wow. that's you know very very common all over the place. Uh, that sort of description everywhere that there's Bigfoot. What did it look like? Blah 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 blah. Didn't have a neck. <laughs> yeah. And really, they, they do have a neck. It's very short. And uh, between the deltoids and the lat muscles that they've got and how built up they are, uh, it, it looks like their back sort of extends up almost to ear level. So you really don't see a neck on them. And that's, they, that's, have, that's they have to turn, right, like Grover Krantz pointed out, if they want to look at something over their shoulder, they have to do like Patty did in the Patterson-Gimlin film. they got to turn their whole upper torso because if they try and turn their head, it runs into they can't turn their jaw any further and they can't turn their head back any further because their neck is too short. So the only way that they can turn and look like that is to move their whole upper body, uh, which yeah. also gets noticed a lot in reports of people that have had sightings. Right, because, I mean, I'm sure if that thing would have turned around, it, that would take some effort because that whole body would have had to turn around. And, and I'm talking, this thing isn't little. I mean, it was probably, if I was to guess, I mean, I don't know what a horse like ways, but I would say like <laughs> about a half a ton, six hundred pounds or so, maybe, right? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I mean, it's heavy. figure at least a thousand pounds, probably bigger because more massively built than a horse. Sounds like the back was up higher. Right, exactly. And you know, Jesus, if it was that big on all fours, if that thing would have stood up on hind legs, it would have been at least a nine footer, if not taller. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It was just, it was just ginormous, and and you know, I I kind of just blew it off. I mean, I didn't really. I said, yeah, you know, um, wow, that's that's crazy, you know. And I'm, yeah. I, I mean, my neck was almost breaking me trying to keep on. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> trying to not run into anything at the same time. <laughs> As we're passing it, I mean, I I looked until I couldn't see anymore, and and it was still a ways for away from the tree line, still, you know, and. We just kept on doing our training and this and that, and and I didn't say nothing, you know. We, I think we we're training either we were probably there about two weeks, I would say, mm-hmm. and you know they don't give us very much free time. So when we got back to base in uh, Baumholder, Germany, you know, all the buddies are there, and you know we're young, you know, 18 years old, and and you know we're on base, and you could drink beer at that age, you know, you're you're serving in the your the, your service, so. Yeah. You know, you're old enough to drink. You're old enough to die. You're old enough to drink, basically. Yeah, so, well, it makes sense to me. And you're in Germany, land of beer. Woohoo! Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so we get a couple of beers, and I'm I'm sitting there, and there's about probably eight, ten of us, kind of just kicking back in one of the guys' rooms, you know, and talking and stuff, 
this or that or, you know, girls, whatever else we were talking about and life and being stuck over there. And I turn around, I go, well, guys, I go, I don't know how you guys' training was, but, man, I saw something out there. I go, I can't even describe it. And one of the guys turns to me and goes, you saw that too? And when he said that, I swear, we looked at each other. I mean, that's when you get chills. That's when you think there's no way that could have happened. Mm-hmm. And then I was there just you go. imagining it, right? Yeah. And there you go, turn around and talk to somebody that seemed the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. So it was so crazy. I mean, it was, we both looked at each other. Everybody else was like looking. We start talking about it, and everybody's like, no way, you know, wow, no way, you know. And we're talking about it, and we're like, yeah, we seen it, da 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 I mean, it was it was crazy. It was so crazy. What a crazy moment in my life, you know, at 18 years yeah. old over there. Oh, my God. You know, when you think of Germany, you, you think of, you know, like the the – the blonde Frau lines and the Oompa bands and the bratwurst and the beer. And you don't think about running into Bigfoot when you're out driving a tank. That's probably like the last thing on your list of possible occurrences that could possibly happen while you're stationed over in Germany. Oh my God. But uh, there is historical precedent for it. And uh, we do occasionally, there is actually a guy over in Germany that's doing Bigfoot research over there who has also done some research over here in the U.S., so apparently knows what to look for. And I know there's at least uh, three researchers up in Scandinavia that are doing research on Bigfoot up there. So they are apparently on the continent. There are just very, very few of them. Uh, in some of these areas, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, Germany, that's a surprise. You know, there's not that much big forest left there, although there are some tracks that are really ancient that haven't been cut down in, like, forever or hundreds of years um, that things could be living in that are pretty good at avoiding civilized people, which would pretty much include everyone that lives in Germany. Um, so, <laughs> if you know what I mean, there's not many mountain men left running around in the mountains of Germany. Uh, so... And you do hear about the other thing is that uh, that I mentioned to, to Daniel here a little bit ago before we started recording was the uh, there's still missing person reports that come out of the Black Forest over there you know, like every year, and this has been going on for hundreds of years. You know, and it's like, oh, uh, well, that happens every year. Well, don't you get curious why it's happening every year? <laughs> <You know? laughs> or does somebody already know why it's happening, and that's why they're acting in curious about it? But uh, you know, that's that's just really scary um, to have something like that happen. And the other thing that got me from the encounter here was <clears throat> you were in a tank. Tanks are not quiet. There were four tanks. And this thing's just da 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 wandering away, no big hurry. I'll just angle up the hill here toward the tree line, do do do, nothing to worry about. And it makes you wonder if it was like living in this area with this tank range all the time, so it was so used to watching them that it realized that they weren't going to do anything to it, and it could just pretty much ignore them. Right. I, that that's the only explanation. And and what was crazy is this guy was even on my right side. But he was even closer to it than I was. I mean, he was probably only 100 yards away from it. Uh-huh. So he was even closer on my side, you know. And it, it's just interesting because I'll tell you what, night times came and gone and we'd do pull guard duty. And you go out there and you're watching your tanks and you're sitting at the motor pool. Like, you know, things start going through your head out there, just kicking back, doing nothing. And <laughs> that, area, <laughs> that area is loaded with wild boar. I mean, there is so much, I mean, there was over a hundred and something wild boar just eating grass right there in front of us. So, I mean, you think about it, they they have no problem. If they really wanted to eat and, or whatever, what it, I mean, they can live forever. food supply. They got no problem with that. And they, uh, enough Bigfoot researchers down here in the South where we got the feral hog problem going on have documented that at this point that, uh, you know, they treat pigs the same way we do, yum, yum, bacon. And, um, yeah, you know, exactly. if they got them around, they're going to be eating them. So there's your food supply for them. He's got cover to hide in. How many acres do you, do you figure one of these things is? They're good size in order to have tank test, uh, training grounds and stuff. Yeah, I, I don't – I haven't actually looked it up because, you know, I I mean, I just started talking about it. I mean, that, 
again after one of the guys hit me up about it. But I mean, I would say it was miles and miles. Yeah, that's what it, that, you know. That's that's what I would have ballparked it at. You're talking about miles on a side, and this is all fenced off. It's full of wild boar. I'm guessing there's a water supply in there somewhere. So one of these things that can actually <laughs> was either in there to start with or could easily get in there. Uh, this is like heaven. People aren't going to come and bug them. You know, you can keep an eye on the humans that are in there. They do the same thing all the time. They're very predictable. He's got a ready food supply. He's got a ready water supply. Ooh, ooh. big for right. And, and and that forest. I mean, we do tra- tank training, but there's there's no foot traffic. It's not like you could just walk up into this forest and and do whatever you want to do. So I mean, I'm sure they're protected as much as they possibly can. Right. Really, almost and like a reserve. They, yeah, that that makes sense. Why they'd have such a nonchalant attitude? They just don't see humans walking around on foot out in the forest. The only place they see humans walking around is right by, you know, the tank motor pool or where you have like buildings and stuff. Other than that, it's like, no, they come out in these big noisy boxes, and run around a little bit, and then they go back again. Yeah, they're easy to get yeah. get away from. They're pretty obvious. <laughs> And I know everybody's out there thinking, yeah, you know, right, sure, this and that. But one of these days, I mean, I'll tell you what, like like one of the ladies, I mean, I've I seen some comments on Facebook about, sure, you've seen this, or yeah, right, or, or well, I've never seen one. Well, well, guess what? They don't walk up and down Main Street, so uh-huh. you're not going to ever see them. Nope. And I'll tell you, you know, what, this is the most common thing that I hear. Uh, and sometimes it's coming from people that just had a sighting. You know, I've been out in the woods for fill in the blank, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years hunting, and I never saw anything or heard anything that made me think there was a Bigfoot. And then all of a sudden, this one day, and then they start doing some research on it, and they start finding out what the signs are that they're around and the sounds they make and this sort of thing. And then they start going back through their memories going, oh, my God. Was there one right next to me this day when I heard this weird noise? Let me go check that. Oh, my God, that recording sounds exactly like it. Oh, my God, you know. And then they start scaring themselves so bad they don't want to go out in the woods anymore because they're afraid of what they were probably standing right next to a few times and were blissfully unaware of. And uh, sometimes ignorance is, is bliss, and uh, it's it's a good thing. But uh, I think in the long run it's better that people know these things around their, their potential hazard. Um, just as much right. as a large bear or anything else would be. They're not predictable that they're having a bad day and you get in the way and they can swatch you like a basketball and you're going to be in sad shape. Right. You're, you're talking about some of those Jacqueline commercials or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Harry and the Hendersons, the worst piece of propaganda ever put out. Hey, <laughs> well, honestly, I'll tell you what, though, but the, they're, the sizing is probably correct. I mean, I mean it's, it's, actually, they're probably smaller on all these commercials than what they really are. And, and I mean, less powerful because these things are ginormous, that, you know, at least the one I've seen. Yeah, well, all the folks that I know that have seen the good size adult ones, uh, you know, they look at the guy in the Jack Lee's commercial and they go, that's eh, a human in a furry suit. Shoulders need to be <laughs> twice as wide, needs to be two feet taller. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, that's the difference. We're not talking about a tall human with fur on him. We're talking about the Incredible Hulk with fur on him is what we're talking <laughs> about here. And the other thing is, huge. Right, and the other thing is I, I see that a lot of them, you know, they, they're what, they're like, they, they could stand upright. This thing, I don't know if it was not as advanced or whatever, but it never stood up on two legs. It was always on four legs. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that was amazing when you did send that picture because you look at all these Bigfoot sightings, this and that, and I know there's different different types and this and that, but it was on all four. So. I yeah. mean, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's people out there and I'm sure they had to have seen the same thing. I mean, they just don't probably uh, say it like I never did, you know? No. Well, and the other thing is when they get a sighting like that, Daniel, usually it's not out in the open. So they have that room for doubt. They see something that's huge and furry and it's on four legs. Okay, it had to have been a bear. Mm. If it's on two legs, it's really hard to convince themselves it's a bear. But if it's on four legs, even if it looks kind of goofy and too big, oh, that's a bear. It had to be a bear. It was on four legs. What else could it be? 
and that's how right. they usually blow it off. And surprisingly, these things, you know, uh, from from the the type twos, which are plentiful throughout most of the lower 48, seemingly considering there's reports of them all over the place, they seem to like going on all fours. So if there's a type over in Europe that runs around on all fours, it would not be surprising at all. They can go just as fast, if not faster, on all fours. And, uh, you know, it also allows them to plow through vegetation and, uh, you know, stay lower to the ground, uh, making it more difficult to spot. So I don't think they have any trouble plowing through vegetation standing up, to be honest with you. <laughs> Just saying, like, yeah. oh, maybe you don't want a branch whapping you in the face quite as often. You're better down there. Yeah, um, I mean, I know. I, I, I've been bear hunting and stuff before, and, and those bears, they don't have no trouble going through anything. Once once they get going, I mean, they're just breaking branches. I mean, the straight, pure yeah. strength alone is ridiculous. Yeah, they're like bulldozers with fangs and claws, basically. <laughs> the, only, the only thing that's more dangerous than that, in my opinion, is the, uh, the, uh, really, uh, the bulldozers with a really bad vision um, that don't have fangs or claws but have a blade about eight feet across. And, of course, I'm talking about moose. Those things oh. are really, really dangerous, you know. You had a one-ton, really dumb animal that can't see what's around them and is prone to just charge anything that moves that it can't immediately identify. Oh, woohoo! Yeah. this is going to be fun. Now that you mention a moose, that's about, you know, that's like the more of the sizing, probably between an elk and a moose on the body size. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. again, too too massive, too wide side to side. Uh, right. Maybe one of the the four footed ungulates, even as big as they get. And yeah, even elk get up over a thousand pounds, you know, routinely. Uh, so you only can imagine how big that boy is. I'd probably estimate around uh, twelve to fifteen hundred, actually, judging from your description. Uh, yeah, just and, just the legs alone. When you see the legs, and there's no, I mean, they're they're all covered with fur, obviously too, but. There is no separation of there's a knee, there's this, and there's that. I mean, they, they're just solid, top to mm -hmm. bottom. Yeah. I mean, I can't even really see any muscle formation or nothing. It was just a a stump, basically like a... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for yeah. laughing, but that's one of their favorite things to pretend <laughs> that they are when they're trying to get you to not look at them. They'll freeze in place and pretend they're a stump. And, man, if they're not right out in the open in the sunlight, they can do a great job of pretending they are one. Yeah, I mean, that's what it looked like, just like a tree trunk. Tree trunks, that's what they were. Uh, yeah. I mean, all the arms and legs were tree trunks. I, I doubt that you've ever heard my first encounter. I was 10 years old, and I was sledding. And I turned around, and something behind me attracted my attention. There was a giant black spruce tree. And I was short enough at 10 years old that I could see underneath the lowest branches. And I noticed what had caught my attention is that the tree had three tree trunks, and two of them had hair on them. And what I was actually looking at was the shins of this Bigfoot that was standing behind this tree sneaking a peek at me from about 40 feet away. Um, so, yeah, uh, at 10 years old, dude? Yep. Wow. Yeah, I yeah. was way about three miles out in the woods behind my folks' house sledding with one of my buddies in a all-newly discovered awesome sledding hill that no one ever went to for some strange reason. And uh, after that day, we never went back there either. But uh, <laughs> glad to have escaped alive. Glad I was at the top of the steepest luge run I ever built in my life before or after. And I was ready to do the high-speed test on it because, man, was that the perfect time to try it out. And at that point, I was a lot more concerned about not going as fast as possible than I was about potentially going off one of the Supers and dying from hitting a tree. I didn't really care at that point. I was way right. more happier to die hitting a tree than I was to be caught by that monster behind me. So I was totally into it, man. I was breaking the world's luge record on that run. But, again, same thing, the, the legs – and this was a huge black, ancient huge black spruce tree. And the shins on this thing were the same thickness as that tree trunk. And that's wow. what blows me away to this day. It's exactly what you're saying. Its limbs are as thick as tree trunks. That's what I'm and talking I, And I would say that that was probably the only encounter you ever had also, right? No, I've had two other ones since then. I had one that decided to come wandering up on the yard six years after that and let me try and walk into him in the dark where he thought I couldn't see him. And then I actually had one that I ran into here in Montana in 2015, but I was out researching in the area it was in. It was a juvenile sentinel, and uh, he thought he was going to pass himself off as a stump, and I didn't fall for it. And he didn't appreciate that, and he gave me quite the dirty stink eye. <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. Well, that's, that's amazing. Well, like I said, the more you know about these things, the more you can be dumb enough to put yourself into the hazardous position of being quite close to them and potentially see one. And I'm not even trying to do that anymore. I'm not trying to, to film one or get pictures of one or see one or anything. I'm just in the areas that they're in just to do research and document what they're doing. I'm specifically interested in uh, the tree and stick structures that they make right now and potentially what these things mean. And I'm trying to get enough information on that to document some of it. And, you know, so far I've actually been able to verify two or three things about them that seem to be actually fact and not just supposition, because every time I check it out, it comes up the same way. So, uh, you know, after a few, a few, you know, dozen times, you can be like, eh, I think there's something to this, because every time I try this, it works out the same way. There's definitely a pattern here. Uh, but, you know, that's the problem with a lot of this research. These things are so smart and so fast when they want to be, and, you know, they just out, uh, outmatch us so completely in the woods um, that the chance of us ever, like, Go find Bigfoot. Yeah, right. You're not going to find Bigfoot. Forget it. If Bigfoot doesn't want to be found, you ain't finding Bigfoot. If you want to find Bigfoot, you need to do like the Shaolin Temple of Squatching teaches. And if you wish to find Bigfoot, you must let Bigfoot find you. <laughs> and that's that's the way it really works. You got to go live near where they are. Don't go to your, don't go in their living room, but go live on their front porch for a while. And if you're not doing anything else and you ain't got no weapons or something, they're going to get real curious. And if you start acting like you're halfway hiding, they're going to get even way more curious. And then they'll be lurking around your camp all the time trying to figure out what the heck you're up to because they're like any other great ape. They're curious. So the more wow. you get their curiosity going, the more they're going to get closer to you. And the more they feel like they're not in danger, there's not multiple humans, you don't have a gun, you don't have a dog. This crazy bastard doesn't even uh, have a campfire at night. <laughs> they get real curious about this. You're acting like a damn Bigfoot. They start wondering what you're up to, and then they get up real close. And they leave tracks right next to your tent. I had uh, um, one one big alpha down on the Blackfoot River decide to let me know that uh, he he knew that I knew that he was there. And I uh, got up in the morning, crawled out of my tent. And the only spot in this area that, that actually had bare ground was right in front of my tent, just because me crawling in and out of it so much had knocked all the leaves and everything away from it, kind of left dirt. And right there with the toes maybe three, four inches from where the flap of the tent was, was this nice, beautiful, perfect left footprint about 19 inches long. <laughs> and, and I went, uh, yeah, okay, dude, I know you're here. Are you, should I leave now? Or? <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have asked that. I, I would have been packed up by that time. <laughs> well, I was down there to keep it. I was down there to find evidence and keep an eye on them because somebody had, uh, in the area had told me that they were pretty sure there was some down there, a bunch of weird things had happened to them. So I went down there wow. and just set up a tent and camped off and on for about three months. And they got so used to me being down there that they just started not paying any attention. And then they started raiding camp and stealing food. And then when that wasn't, you know, then then we wouldn't let that happen. Then they would steal, like, garbage. And then we would, like, take scraps that we were going to put in the garbage and just go put them down on the beach so they wouldn't come into camp. And uh, it was just like, okay, you guys are just being, like, pests now, so we're not going to have food here anymore. And uh, <laughs> and I think the main reason they were hanging around the stretch of river is because it's frequently fished. There's fishermen there all the time, and there's rough fish in this river that are not indigenous. And they tell you if you catch them, just throw them up on shore. So uh, guess what these fishermen are doing, right? So as soon as the sun goes down and all the fishermen leave, Bigfoot gets up, walks along the shoreline, picks up all the fish and the guts from the good ones that they drop there, and gets all that free food. And then, you know... Go go pester the locals, check the dumpsters, uh, go bug those idiots over there in that camp and steal some of their food. They can't count. Take two pork chops, leave two. They think it's the same. Uh, <laughs> we did that to us. We had four pork chops. Next day we had two. Okay, what animal steals two pork chops? <laughs> and doesn't take the other two. And then tries to hide it and make it look like the other two that it took weren't taken. Oh, <laughs> uh, 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 uh. There's a real small uh, list of animals that actually have the sort of like human-like hands, like raccoons and otters and stuff. They could manipulate anything like that, and none of them would stop at just taking one piece. They'd take all of it, right, right, all the package away. They wouldn't like slit the edge, pull out two of the four pork chops, 
put the bag back together again, put the top down the way it just it looked when you got there, and walk <laughs> off of the two park tops. And it wasn't a human that did it because these park tops had spoiled, turned gray, and we were going to throw them away the next day. That's why they were sitting in this package on the ground. So. <laughs> <laughs> And I talked to other Bigfoot guys on this, too, and they said, yeah, they ain't too sure about counting. And they said, as long as they leave us with some, maybe we don't know that any of them are missing. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. I mean, they're, they're smart, just not that smart. It, yeah, they're smart you take, in the air, you know, or something, so that's funny. Yeah, if you take all of them, the humans will figure out that you took all of them. But if you just take some, that's different. They're kind of dumb, then. They won't know that you took just some of them. <laughs> <laughs> and they may have been, they may have like developed that idea um, just from the way that like farmers dealt with them and stuff too. You know, they'd come and raid the chicken coop and steal a couple eggs or a hen or something. The farmer wouldn't get all bent out of shape. If all the chickens disappeared at one time, farmer goes and gets his gun and tries to track down the perpetrator. Um, so <laughs> they may have just developed this sort of thing out of their, you know, what they've noticed from raiding humans in the past. If you only take some of it, they don't get bent out of shape and go after you, so don't take all of it. Yeah, I, I could see that happening. I mean, I I could definitely see that. Uh, one of my that's guests that I had on, uh, Lynn Poole, uh, who had a bad run-in with him over in Indiana, um, he had been really on close terms with all the local farmers and stuff in this area for years before this happened because he was in the area hunting and fishing all the time and he had right, you know, permission from all of them to be on their property. And after this incident, he started talking to them about it and it turned out like pretty much all of them knew that these critters were in the area and they even knew that they occasionally would come on their farm and all like, uh, you know, there was chicken farmers, a good example. They'd come and do exactly what I just described. They'd take a few chickens and they wouldn't take all of them. And it would happen once a year. So he just couldn't, you know, decided to not do anything about it. And the other farmer down the road, he's got a pig farm. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, they haven't taken anything this year. Last year they took a couple. And he's like, oh, just a couple. And he's like, well, they were like medium size. Uh, actually saw him make off of those ones. He stepped over the fence picked up one under each arm and then stepped back over the fence with them and took off. Okay. <laughs> How big were they? Oh, about 300 pounds apiece. Wow. And you can imagine the pig isn't just going like, oh, you're my buddy, pick me up. It's probably struggling a little bit, too. <laughs> yeah. And for them to be able to just wrap their arm around that, there's the amazing part. Mm -hmm. And then just like walk over the fence that's keeping the pigs in like it ain't even there because you're big enough to just step over it. Yeah, and I guess they figure why take it all if they, I mean, they're smart enough to know if they take it all, they can't come back and get it, basically. Right, and the next farmer will be mad at them, and the next time they show up, they'll get shot at. And that's another thing most people don't think about. They've obviously observed hunters shooting at things. They've seen what guns can do. And even oh, bears yeah. and stuff, and, and, and mountain lions are smart enough to know what that means. Up here, they think it's a dinner bell. They hear a gunshot. They go toward it to see if there's a yummy gut pile to eat. So, obviously, Bigfoot knows what a front is. So, uh, you know, draw your own conclusions about that. If if they think they're going to get the, the farmer to show up with a gun shooting at them, that's not a good situation. So, if you limit how much you're taking from each farmer and spread it around, none of them get mad and shoot at you. Okay, this seems to be working. We can do this system next year. <laughs> I'm not saying this is how they're thinking. I'm not saying this is how they're planning things out. But from the way this description, from what I was getting from Lynn, it sounds like in that area at least, they had habituated the farmers to the point where the farmers would let them steal something from them like basically once a year and wouldn't put up a stink about it as long as that's all the more often it was. Right, exactly. That that's amazing. So yeah, there's there's just so much of this weird stuff going on that people don't normally hear about and aren't exposed to. It just uh, it boggles your mind, you know. And when you're in the position like I'm at, where uh, you know I've got enough recognition that people actually get a hold of me and tell me stories and stuff like that, it gets to be even more mind-boggling because there's a lot of this stuff that they don't want to come on and talk about. And I don't blame them because some of it's just, oh my God, I'm glad it didn't happen to me. <laughs> but, and, I, and I'm sure by, by the amount of people you talk to, you you could tell, I mean, when someone's basically telling the truth or at least the truth that they think compared to, yeah, right, I mean, I mean, what kind of fame are you trying to get out of this basically, right? Yeah, exactly. That's 
there's, you know, there's people that are in it just for a thrill because it's fun to be a hoaxer, and there's people that are in it uh, to try and make a buck off of it. And there's uh, there's plenty of people in the Bigfoot community that are turning out books and whatnot that really shouldn't be and are making a buck off of it. And, you know, if somebody wants to read their books, whatever, that's that's up to them. But uh, the, the most reputable people in the community that I know of are all the people that don't sell books or anything and just sort of give their information away and are trying to help people like, uh, you know, right. Brenda Harris, Bigfoot Outlaws, Randy, Kate Maniazzi, um, folks like that, you know, and some of the, there's some of the, the really good talk show people. That, I like that too. Wes Germer tries to help people a lot with Sasquatch Chronicles because that show was started because he had an encounter and didn't know what the hell it was that he saw and it ruined his life basically. And he didn't have a place to go with it. So he decided to make a show for people like him that had seen something weird and needed somebody they could talk to that had seen something else and just like them and, you know, a place to go with it. And and so, of course, it became very popular because there's plenty of people that have seen Bigfoot. They just didn't have a place to talk about it. So, uh, you know, I consider people like that to be a true asset to the community and getting the facts on some of this stuff out there because they're willing to take the time to listen to people's stories to put it out there. And to, uh, you know, just let everybody draw your own conclusions. Um, you don't have to believe every story. You don't have to believe everything that everybody says. But you should have an open mind. You should listen to what they're saying to you. And, you know, i got a pretty good BS detector. I catch about 99% of them within the first minute or so that I'm talking to them. Uh, sometimes I get them. I'll have some really, you know, amazing encounters and stuff. And I'll actually have them tell me the story two or three times before I'll put them on the air and let them record it. Um, just to see if they change any of the details or the facts or anything, or ask them a question like the second time through I didn't the first time. And, uh, right. you know, so, yeah, generally they don't sneak past. So, but, you know, it isn't ultimately like I wasn't there for any of these encounters that my guests are telling me, so I don't know that they actually happened. All I've got is my guests' word for it. And to me, it sounds like they actually saw something. They are telling me what they believe to be the truth. You know, are they hallucinating or was it really there? I don't know. But to me, they're telling me whatever it was that they really believe that they really experienced and saw. And that's good enough because that's as close as you can get without, you know, having a chunk of one in your hand. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're out there. I, that, that's one thing I could say. I mean, at least I've seen one. I mean, I don't know. If, I mean... <laughs> Hey, you had the best of all possible encounters. You were nice and safely inside a tank. I don't know how much more safely protected you could be when you were seeing a Bigfoot, but I would think other than being, you know, seeing one on shore from a battleship, you pretty much had the best protection available right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I definitely wasn't worried, that's for sure. <laughs> well, and that's the thing that blows me away again about your encounter is how un- worried this critter look the whole time i mean just like eh, those big those big moving metal cans with the people in them they never mess with me i'll just slowly wander toward the tree line right exactly he was just probably i don't know what they were what it was doing out there in the open field i mean it was still early so who really knows what he was up to you know? <laughs> getting back from a hard night of uh Eating bacon, probably. <laughs> Heading back to his daytime napping spot. <laughs> yeah, he, he, was, shoot, he probably liked the grouse right there. Who knows? I mean, you know, yep. maybe this, here's a nice pill, nice little bed. Or, I mean, you, you never know what these things are thinking, obviously. Sure. <laughs> yeah, it's just really fascinating to me, and I'm really glad that you came on and decided to, to tell you and Connor because we just got so little information about, uh, you know, mystery uh, uh, primates, anomalous bipedal cryptids, ABCs from over there in Europe. Um, so it's really great to get any reports that we can get our hands on on that. And, you know, it's like it is in the U.S. here. The more reports you've got, the more you can compare the information and you can start seeing, you know, clues will start to emerge because there are patterns in this information. If it's real information, there's going to be repeated patterns in it. And lo and behold, there are. So <laughs> that's how we managed to put together a lot of the stuff that we figured out so far. And a lot of the stuff we figured out when you go and try and actually like test it in the field, lo and behold, oh, it seems to hold true out in the field again. Wow, how interesting. <laughs> so, you know, try well, and error. I'm, I'm, I'm it's over there, too. I mean, I'm not saying 
Well, yeah, apparently the dang things are everywhere. Uh, <laughs> I've had a researcher down in Australia on talking about them down there, too. They're all over the place. Yeah, I do a lot of hunting and, and fishing up in the hills. And I, honestly, here in the U U.S., I've never seen anything even close to that, you know. I've mm -hmm. probably seen one one something that I didn't know what it was to this day, but it was so fast. I mean, I I probably can't even describe it either. So, yeah, that, that's another again, story. That, that that's where a lot of the, you know, probably ninety percent of the Bigfoot sightings. It's so fast, you're not sure exactly what it is. You didn't get a really good look at it. So no way in hell are you going to come out and say, "Well, that might have been a Bigfoot." Oh, no, 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 no. That's the last thing you're going to say. So you know, there's a ton of people out there that have actually had Bigfoot sightings and encounters that are never going to tell the story because they're just flat out not certain that that's what they saw, and for good reason. They just didn't get a good enough look at it. Right. Exactly. You know, I, I I do talk to some old timers around here. You know, 35 years ago, and and they swear up and down that they seen them way back in the days. But, but <laughs> you know, that doesn't necessarily mean they're not around still. It means back in the day, those old timers were really stealthy. So occasionally, they would get the drop on one of them and get to look at it. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I'll tell you what. You know, most of the time they had a gun or a rifle, but they would never pick it up. And I think no. maybe in those days, those old timers that, I mean, may, maybe they knew them. Maybe they seen them. Maybe they seen them hunting that area before and and yep. weren't a threat, you know. I mean, and then they'd hide behind trees and stuff and just peek out, look at them. And, and you know, <laughs> it, they were a lot smarter. I mean, they didn't just stand there, you know, in the open. No. Mm -hmm. no at they're least not that's what the stories I hear. No, they don't stand out in the open and let you see. You know, if they stand out in the open, they want you to see them. If they want you to see them, it generally means you need to get the hell out of there like yesterday. Um, yeah. <laughs> they're sending you a message. Generally, it's the alpha male that's going to be doing something like that, and he's letting you see him on purpose because that's a threat. He's telling you to get the hell out of there. And if you don't get screamed at or have something thrown after you immediately afterwards, you're damn lucky. Wow, that's a yeah. I'm I'm good. I'm I'm I don't need to see that. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying. You had the best of all possible encounters. You weren't even on the road having one run across it. You know, in the middle of the night, making you slam on your brakes or anything. You're in the middle of the day, beautiful conditions, driving along, having a great time in your M1 Abrams tank, and there's a Bigfoot. Okay, well I'm not too worried about that, but that's really weird. <laughs> 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 oh my god thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing your encounter daniel i really appreciate it man uh if you have any you know, more questions about bigfoot or anything in the future feel free to contact me i would like to talk to people and sometimes i even know the answer um so sounds good and uh no thank you for for putting me on it was great at least people know a little bit more than what they started with so that's good too well, and that's the general direction we're trying to work in. I'm trying to give them more interesting bits of information on every show that they can think about, and they can try and uh, put those weird little jigsaw pieces together and try and make a picture out of it. I know I've been at it a long time, and I got some of the pictures solved. and <laughs> Maybe not the one I was expecting originally, but it's getting closer. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm no expert by any means. I just had that one encounter, but I'll tell you what. I mean, it, it was very interesting, and... And shoot, this is probably the last time I'll talk about it. I imagine, you know. So, I mean, it's, it's not something you'd like to really tell people about either. You know, they're like, man, no. you know that dude. You know what he told me about a bigfoot? Yeah, and he's a little crazy, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, and it's even worse for people that have had the really uh, terrifying encounters because they not only get that ridicule factor, but they really need to talk about that. They're it's traumatic. It's like oh, having PTSD, and there's no way you can get treatment for it, and there's nobody you can talk to. There's no groups. There's no counseling. There's no nothing. And if you do tell somebody about it, instead of getting help, you get ridiculed. Well, gee, that's a really great position to be in. Wow, well, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky nothing like that ever happened to me, that's for sure. I wouldn't even know what to do or how to act, I imagine. Yeah, it takes you – well, I'm not – I still got PTSD from my first encounter, which was over 40 years ago, so there you go shouldn't see big giant monsters in the woods when you're 10 years old. 
doesn't do good <laughs> things to your uh, doesn't do, do good things to your perception of reality. You tend to doubt everything everyone tells you after that, and uh, <laughs> you, you go into this. I'm going to double check facts on everything phase for about thirty years. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, all, all you've been hearing your whole life is uh, there's no such thing. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can imagine you doubting yourself from that point on. Well, even at 10 years old, you know, at that age, you're still, you know, like into like seeing monster movies and horror and all that kind of stuff. That's all. That's all really cool. And everybody tells you there's no such thing as monsters. And then you see one flesh and blood bright afternoon, 40 feet away. And you go, look. That's a friggin' monster. Quit trying to tell me there's no such thing as monsters because there's one right there. Shut up. You guys are lying. What else have you been lying to me about? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it, it turns your world upside down, you know, and it's a, it's a life changer for just about anybody that has one, even for somebody like you that had the best of all possible encounters, the safest of all possible encounters. It still shakes up your world because all of a sudden it's like, holy crap, those things aren't supposed to exist. What else is around? Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure there's plenty of stuff that we don't know about, too, you know, that people just don't really see it. I mean, all these pictures, all these different things that people come up with in their heads and and stuff, a lot of that stuff, I mean, if there's a little bit of truth in this, there's obviously truth in other, other aspects too, out there also, you know? Yeah. Yeah, like I used to, uh, uh, I've heard Bear mention this before, and it's a beautiful way of saying it, that, uh, you know, I talk to the native tribes to get more information on Bigfoot, because I'm really interested in Bigfoot. And while we're in the process of just talking about this, they stray off on topics about other cryptids. And they talk about the Thunderbird and the little people and stuff, and you start going, whoa, 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 wait a minute now. How am I, on the one hand, going to say, okay, give me information on Bigfoot, I believe you're telling me the truth, and then on the other hand going, ah, oh, you're totally BSing me about these Thunderbirds and little people. <laughs> so where do you draw the line? See, that's the problem. Once you open that can of worms, uh, if one thing that isn't supposed to exist exists, what other things that aren't supposed to exist actually exist? I know. That, that there is no line to be drawn. I mean, if you, if, I mean, if they said they seen this or that, I mean, obviously they seen the other stuff. Is it still around? Who knows? Yeah, see, but, uh, that's, you know, that's the real it, it, question. Uh, Somebody was seeing something at some point. <laughs> what did they see exactly, and is it still there? And if they're still seeing these things, then it starts getting really creepy because, you know, part of the job of a cryptozoologist is like the Brothers Grimm. You go around and you correct, collect these old legends and folklore and fables and stuff, and you write down all these stories before people forget about them, before the oral tradition is lost. Then you go back and you look at them and you go, is there any correlation between this story to reality? In other words, in every story, there's a, a little gem of truth. There's a little teeny pile of truth in there that got this big giant story around it. And where's the truth in this that actually started it out? And like in the case of Bigfoot, you can collect all these legends from all over North America, from all the native tribes about Bigfoot. And when you start taking away all of the, the, the window dressing from the individual tales that they're telling these tribes and just stick to the details that they're all giving you that are the same, they're all talking about the same critter. It's really obvious. <laughs> It really, really is. I mean, you have to be, you know, like low-grade moron to not be able to figure that out after you look at all the information on it. It's like, okay, either every single native tribe in North America, we're all having this gigantic hallucination about this furry guy running around the woods, or he's real. There's your two choices. Uh, <laughs> Little too many puffs on the peace pipe, then, is what you're trying to tell me, then, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's like every you know, <laughs> out of the millions of natives in North America, they were all hallucinating that Bigfoot was real. Yeah, that's a lot harder to believe than Bigfoot is real. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I'm done with my preaching, and uh, I don't want to waste any more of your valuable time. we got a beautiful weekend going on here, and you have a triumphant weekend going on over your place with your children stomping butt in local sport activities and, and you doing pretty good in a fishing contest. So I'm going to let you get back to enjoying your life. But thanks again so much for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate it. All right. You're welcome. All right. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening to the show. And we'll be back again next time for another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. Until then, take care of each other. Be safe and do not hug the Wookiee.